right, we'll go ahead and get started with the talk today. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Ruchika. I work at um, in the People Development Department within People Operations, uh, particularly focusing on well-being learning for Googlers. Um, I have uh, helped co-found uh, GPOS program, and I also teach Search Inside Yourself. Our team also brings other programs like Managing Your Energy. We're working on um, an online version of you know Good Stress, Bad Stress program that will be brought to you very soon. Uh, I'm really uh, passionate about uh, mindfulness as a vehicle for me to have sanity in my work life and in my personal life. Uh, I started uh, these practices about eight years ago, and they have been profoundly helpful um, in all kinds of difficult situations in my life. Uh, my journey started with Search Inside Yourself program here, and I've done some work outside as well. Uh, but as a parent, um, I find so many moments where just being present and aware in times of difficulty when our children are sick, they're having a tantrum. Um, I have an 11-year-old daughter, uh, a middle schooler, and a one-year-old son, and I have a lot of like moments where I, uh, I just don't know how I can be helpful in that particular situation, so staying mindful and present um, and open to whatever is happening in that moment is has been tremendously helpful. So to support that and share it with all of you, as part of GPOS, we are trying to uh, integrate mindful parenting program at Google, where we will bring speakers uh, at least once a quarter, if not more, to talk about this topic and potentially also, also offer some classes or give you resources that you can avail outside of Google. So, so with that introduction, I'm really excited to have Isa Gucciari here to talk to us about conscious parenting today. Um, she describes this talk as, let's face it, parenting is hard. We agree, parenting is hard. <laughs> Most of us become parents with very little idea about what will be asked us, uh, of us and what we will need to ask of ourselves. In order to offer our children as many opportunities to be successful in navigating the complexities of modern life, we have to gain great awareness of how we can best meet those challenges. Um, in this talk, Isa Gucciari covers important topics to help parents meet their children with as much love, discernment, and capacity as possible, while offering strategies to help parents gain greater confidence and, and enjoyment raising their children. Um, so Isa it holds a degree uh, and certificates in psychology, cultural and linguistic anthropology, comparative religion, hypnotherapy, and transformational healing. She is the creator of highly effective therapeutic model called Depth Hypnosis, and she's also the author of Return to the Great Mother, a book that she's gifted to me this morning, and I'm eager to read that. Um, it's a book on birthing. Uh, Isa is the founding director of the Foundation of the Sacred Stream and teaches nationally and internationally. She has two children, so she's been there. It's not all abstract. I'm sure she'll share some of her own experiences with us as well and an active counseling practice in San Francisco where she resides with her partner. Please join me in welcoming Isa, uh, who will take us through this one hour of journey on conscious parenting together. Isa. Well, thank you, Ruchika. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, just a moment to thank Ruchika for all the work that she has done in carrying forward the legacy of Meng and your own in inspiration to benefit the Google community. And I've actually had the good fortune to join you here um, a couple of times over the last year. Um, in May, I was here with Tupten Jimpa, who is His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's main English language interpreter. And he was here speaking on his book, uh, his new book called um, A Fearless Heart, which is um, an amazing book. If you're looking for tools to become more conscious, try that book. <laughs> and if you didn't get to see his uh, talk when he was here, I think it's on YouTube and you can you know, benefit from seeing that. And um, it was actually on Meng's last day, last fall, that I accompanied Robert Thurman, who, is, um, who came to speak to the Google community about spirituality and the workplace. And, um, 
again, he's another wonderful teacher if you're looking for resources to become more aware. His book, Infinite Life, really focuses on uh, qualities that can help you as you're parenting. So, um, and over the last year, I've also gotten to know Ruchika a little bit better. And one of the things that I've seen is that we really share a common vision. And that vision is to try to bring as much mindfulness, as much awareness, as much consciousness to as many people as possible. So it's such a privilege to be here, to be able to share uh, that vision, and uh, to be able to speak to you on the topic of conscious parenting. Um, as Ruchika said, I'm the parent of two children, and I've been counseling and teaching families and uh, children, teens, couples over the last 20 years. And over the course of the last 10 years, I've noticed a big shift in the central issues around parenting. And those, sh that shift is due mainly to the more central role that technology is now playing in the family. And I think this is one of the big, big challenges that parents are trying to work with. And the challenges that parents face today in raising children are really, really different than the challenges that parents, their parents faced. Not only do parents have to figure out how to do with less sleep, but they also have to determine the role they want technology to play in their child's development. If parents find themselves with less time than they would like to devote to parenting, they have to figure out new strategies for discipline, nourishment, and enrichment. And this is difficult when people find themselves trying to navigate the issues around work-life balance. Many times people have to face down issues of self-doubt and guilt and trying to make the choices that they want to make for their best and highest good for their children. So one of the first steps that parents must take toward meeting these challenges and learning to parent more consciously is to develop a good understanding of their own values. If parents want to be able to raise children who can meet the challenges of the future with an open heart and a focused mind, they must not only understand, but be able to clearly communicate their values to their children in everything they do and in everything they say. So in order to be able to communicate values clearly and to apply them in a consistent way, Parents must spend some time learning what their values are. This may sound simple, but it's surprising to see how many people struggle to articulate their values for themselves, and much less for their children. The effort to engage in this articulation is very important. Perhaps one of the most important steps that parents must take in order to parent with more mindfulness and more awareness. Because parenting is taking place now in such a different environment, role models and mentors are difficult to come by. This compounds an already age-old problem, which is that many of us were parented by people who weren't parented well themselves. So we have this legacy of less than ideal situations leading into parenting. So many parents just don't have the role models they need readily at hand when they're trying to make decisions about screen time, toilet training, internet privacy, curfews, you know, it's all, all, it's all together. And it's important, therefore, to seek role models who hold the values that you hold and seek their help. In order to do this, you have to define your own values. What is important to you? Do you know how to begin to answer this? Do you have a clear idea of what values you want your children to bring forward into the world as they mature and take their place in confronting the complexities of the modern world?
Let's start at a very, fairly high level here looking at values. So I'd like you to just take a moment and focus inward and allow yourself to consider two spiritual values that are important to you. So just, just let yourself think for a moment. What are two spiritual values that are important to you? And if you're co-parenting, what are two spiritual values you know to be of value to your co-parent? If there are differences in your sets of values, what is your strategy for bridging those differences so you can present a unified message to your children. If your values are similar, what kinds of activities and interactions do you create on a regular basis to communicate those values to your children? Given the importance of these values, whom do you have to turn to to help you continue to address and develop these values in parenting your children? You can see how much goes into the development of just one set of values. But there are many other values to look at in order to be able to parent with as much mindfulness, awareness, and consciousness as possible. As I was putting my thoughts together to talk to you, I thought I was going to touch more fully on the issues that we touch on in the conscious parenting classes at the Sacred Stream Center in Berkeley, California. These classes focus on helping parents locate inner resources and learning how to draw upon them better. They focus on helping parents articulate their needs and values. And they help parents learn how to work effectively with willfulness and focus on discipline more effectively. And they offer parents strategies for parenting a child who is challenged. The reason for examining these issues in the context of conscious parenting is simple. When these issues are addressed, the protection and cultivation of the child's authentic expression in the world is assured. And if you were to ask me to define one goal that we as parents must do our best to attain, I would say that it is this, the protection and cultivation of our child's authentic expression in the world. So that is the topic I would like to focus on here today. Whenever I'm working with families, especially the parents of young children, I always try to walk a line between creating a forum where people can understand themselves more fully so that they can understand how many resources they actually have and offering advice or counsel from that place, and the line between offering opinion. I, it's really easy for me to go into opinion about parenting. <laughs> but I'm really going to try not to do that, but I might. I might wander into the opinion place because this is really so close to my heart, this, this idea of being able to protect your child's expression in the world. This is so important. Many great educators, including Maria Montessori and Rudolf Steiner, spoke to this issue each in their own way. They each offered structures that support children in having the freedom to discover their own unique talents, gifts, and capacities. And they also offer structures to address areas of weaknesses 
or obstacles that children may have which affect their ability to fully move into the world with those native gifts. The reason that the discussion around values is so important is because it is values that become the structures we offer our children within which they learn to express themselves. I'm going to say that again because it sounds complicated, but not, can't get there. I'm going to do it again. The reason that the discussion around values is so important is that values become the structures we offer our children within which they learn to express themselves. If we do not have clarity around our own values, we cannot offer effective structures to our children. And worse, if we have no values or values that actually inhibit the authentic expression of the child, children spend important in developmental time trying to adapt themselves to values which have nothing to do with their authentic expression and which, in fact, may impede it. How many of you have spent time trying to navigate around a parent with anger issues or addiction issues? What did that do to your ability to know what calls to you from your own heart? It is, I believe, important to consider that our most important task as parents is to try to develop a family system whose structures support the authentic expression of the highest potential of our children, to help them learn how to listen to what is calling to them in their own hearts. This may sound easy, but it's not. When some people hear this, they think, OK, anything goes. Let the kids do whatever they want. As long as they're expressing, it's going to be OK. Or other parents may hear this and think, OK, I have to figure out what my child's highest potential is and steer that child toward them at every turn. Other parents may respond, they're my kids. They're going to do what I want, not what they want. But the task at hand is more nuanced than any of these approaches. First of all, we need to define what we mean by a child's highest potential, which I am using interchangeably here with the child's deepest calling, the child's most authentic expression, the child's gifts. I'm using these terms interchangeably because they each offer a different view and definition of that, that point to the complexity of the deepest aspects of our children. Naturally, every child's highest potential has its own expression. Every child has a set of gifts that she brings into the world that resonate with her highest calling. We must at once try to tune ourselves to this deepest aspect of our children, understand its requirements, and get out of the way of impeding its expression, while at the same time creating structures which support it. This may sound like rubbing your belly and tapping your head at the same time, and indeed it is. But it is something we can learn how to do. So I would like to identify some of these tasks that will help you with this process, first individually, and then show you how to put them together so that the tapping and the rubbing seems intuitive and easy. These tasks center around a set of questions I would like to offer you. First, how do I recognize my child's deepest calling? Two, how do I recognize my child's gifts? Three, why do I have to get out of the way of the expression of my child's potential? Four, how do I get out of the way? And five, what does it mean to create structures that support the expression of my child's potential? So 
So we're going to address each one of these individually. The first question is, how do I recognize my child's deepest calling? This is actually surprisingly easy to do. It is really just a matter of watching what your child is drawn to. Your children will naturally be drawn to their highest calling if they are not interrupted. How do I recognize my child's gifts? The answer is the same. Watch what your child is drawn to. But recognizing the child's gifts goes one step further. This involves watching what games the child creates, what stories the child tells, and the way the child seeks to express herself. There is an important part to cultivating a child's gifts that has to do with the filtering of the kind of information that the child uses as raw material for that expression. And I will speak to that in just a moment. The next question is, why do I have to get out of the way of the expression of my child's potential? We tend to think of our children as ours. but they actually belong to themselves. If they are lucky, their path through this life is a long one that extends far beyond the few years that we care for them. It is important to consider that your ideas about what you want for your child, beyond wanting them to be happy and safe, might become interrupting to their natural expression. How many of you wanted to study music, but were told by your parents you had to go to business school? What message did this give you about the possibility of being supported in the world by your deepest calling? How does this affect you on a daily basis today? With this information, consider how important it is to give your child the message that he can trust his deepest calling and that he will be able to find a way to let that expression of that calling, whatever that expression is, support him. Give him practice in letting all the potential that the calling and that calling express itself by supporting what he loves and step out of the way. Next question is, how do I get out of the way? Well, I've got a long answer to this question. <laughs> so bear with me. <laughs> One of the best ways to get out of the way is to look at your attachments to your children being a particular way. Those attachments are probably a function of something that did not work in your own childhood. For instance, let's say you grew up in a household without a mother present, and you felt her absence keenly. You grow, you marry a woman, and you have children. And then you realize this woman is more problematic than I thought. This is not the person I thought I was marrying. But now you have children. And because you know how hard it was for you not to have a mother, you put up with all kinds of bad behavior from your spouse or from the child's mother, rather than take the child and leave the situation and take the risk that the child may grow up without a full-time mother figure. If you were not so attached to your child having a mother because of the pain that you experienced at not having a mother, you might have more clarity in responding to your spouse's bad behavior. Who knows, not having this problematic woman in your child's life on such a consistent basis might be the best thing for your child. But you cannot see this or even consider it because of the unaddressed issues that you carry from your own wounding at being motherless. 
In many ways, when we talk about conscious parenting, we are talking about becoming more conscious of ourselves. We are talking about understanding what motivates us before we even approach our children. The examination of our motivation and the way that it drives decision making is a good example of one of the steps in the process of becoming a more aware parent. Again, one of the best ways to get out of the way is to stop risking interrupting your child's authentic expression and to look deeply at your own experience of being parented. Seek to understand the aspects of your upbringing that worked best for you and your own self-expression. And ask how you can apply that understanding to serving your child's expression. In this way, you can tap into your own resources and become your own mentor. You can also look at, at the aspects of your upbringing that did not work for you and get help in changing the way that these aspects of your childhood affect you today. <laughs> I, remember, I remember when I first found out I was pregnant with my first child. I was, I, I was looking at the pregnancy indicator and it was like, it was yes, and I'm like, oh. And I literally, with the indicator still in my hand, I ran to the phone. We made phone calls back then. I ran to the phone and I called a therapist and I literally had the, the receiver for the phone and the, and the pregnancy kit indicator in my hand because I knew there was no way I was gonna be able to face the challenges of mothering with all of my own, unin my own childhood experience affecting me in an uninformed way. I, I, you know, there was, I mean, I, I didn't know much back then, but I knew that, right? So not only do you have to get out of the way by addressing your own unexamined experience in order to be as clear as possible about how to support your child's potential, but it is also important to look at the experience that the child is exposed to in the larger cultural context. With the newfound clarity gained in looking at your personal issues, you can determine if the experience of the larger cultural environment is supporting your child's potential or not. And this is where that raw material the child uses to formulate her expression that I just spoke about comes in. And it is also where the issue of values comes into play in a very powerful way. You have to understand what you value and what you don't value in the larger cultural context. How do you feel about screen time versus personal engagement. Something to think about for a minute. What role should technology play in early childhood development? What level of violence in computer games is acceptable to you? How do you feel about letting children play with toy guns? The answer to these questions will determine the answer to the last question for you. What does it mean to create structures that support the expression of my child's potential? The choices that you make around values create the structures that support your child's development. If you have no defined value system, the values of the larger cultural context will become the structure that supports or impedes your child's expression. 
If your values are based on an unexamined response to the way you were parented, they will become the structures that support or impede the expression of your child's authentic self. Is this what you want for your child? If the answer is no, you will already understand why conscious parenting is so important. If you enter into parenting without being aware of the values that are driving your decisions around parenting, you will not know how to define or articulate your values. If you don't have clear values, you cannot know how to create structures that support you in skillfully guiding the manifestation of your child's highest potential. So as you get ready to practice rubbing your belly and tapping your head at the same time as you step into becoming a more conscious parent, just remember, all you have to do is observe carefully what your child is drawn to. What stories is he telling you? How does she express herself? Invest time in looking at your own experience of being parented and see what worked for you and what did not. Take time to understand the extent to which you want the larger cultural context to participate in the formation of your child. If you follow these steps, you will know how to create experiences which provide enough structure to nurture your child's potential, but not so much structure that it stifles the expression of your child's heart's deepest calling. See, not so hard. Conscious parenting may not be as hard as you thought. <clears throat> In these times, when we are facing societal upheaval, environmental destruction, and so much uncertainty about the prospect that technology has for delivering us from an increasingly unstable future. I believe it is our responsibility as parents to do our best to raise children who as adults meet the challenges of the future with an open heart and a focused mind. It will be much easier for them to do this and to attain this level of clarity if they can listen to their heart's calling if they know what their gifts are, and if they can trust the expression of their highest potential and know how it will support them, not only themselves, but those around them. So if you'd like to explore these matters in more depth and gain more insight in how to parent more consciously, Please join us at the Sacred Stream Center in Berkeley. Uh, classes are starting, weekly classes are starting March 2nd. And if you're interested in our offering those classes in this context here to the Google community, just let Ruchika know. But for now, I ask you to bring forward some questions. I love questions, uh, even questions on things we haven't covered because there's so much to parenting that it's hard to cover it in a short talk. So, uh, please. Anybody have any question? You had a question, right? Ruchika, did you want to say something? Pass on the mic. Oh, okay. Put it under here. There it is. You had a question, right? He had a question. Hi, I'm Philip. Thanks for uh, being here. Uh, my question is uh, the things you talked about, do you have any data of how much it actually matters? As in, you know, give. Uh, child a good environment to grow up in, but all these micromanagerial types of things, do they actually matter? Like if we, you know, obstruct the child's expression of their talents, aren't they going to end up actually doing what they want anyways? I mean, how much real uh, direction control do we have as parents? Like this is all something we might choose to do, but in retrospect, does it really matter? Well, you know, if you're going to speak at that level, you know, then you're, you know, you're saying, well, a child has their own destiny. They have their own fate. 
It doesn't matter what we do because they're following it. Is that what you're saying? I, I'm not a proponent of faith. I'm just asking about the data. <laughs> um, I think that it's, it's difficult when you're dealing with issues of expression of sort of the ineffable. It's hard to have hard data that supports or that denies the efficacy or the, the authenticity of that expression because we are really far into the ineffable when we think about what is, the, what is it that impels us into the world? What is it that draws us? And, you know, I've been working, you know, I spend most days working with people who have been really badly wounded in their childhood, where they've had, they've had, you know, I mean, I sometimes I joke around and I say, all you have to do these days in order to be wounded is be born. <laughs> it's, it's so hard to be in the world right now. But, you know, I, one of the things that I see again and again every day, I mean, 10 hours a day, is that people who have been hurt or interrupted in being able to rest in themselves have serious problems later in life. And those problems can range from anxiety, depression. I mean, look at the number of people. You want data? Look at the number of people who are on antidepressants. Was it like 20 million? So, I mean, sometimes I'm in a grocery store and I look around and I, I realize I'm the only person in this place that is not altered, either on prescription drugs or on pot or on alcohol or on heroin or on ice. You know, it's like everybody is trying to get away from themselves. And the reason they're trying to get away from themselves is because they weren't parented well. <laughs> people who can rest in themselves, people who know themselves, people who understand what's important for them, and want to express that importance and trust that they can express that importance don't need drugs. So I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully I got somewhere near there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. but, as I've been trying to become uh, more mindful in my own practice and, and not trigger as quickly and you know, be a little more detached and that sort of thing, one of the places I've found it hardest to do that is in parenting, I have a almost five-year-old girl and a one-and-a-half-year-old boy, and one of the things I've noticed is, um, you know, they, obviously kids trigger you a lot, right? They're sort of almost programmed to. But I've also found, I, I try to sometimes be detached and just sort of say, oh, let's do this thing, let's do this thing. But oftentimes being a little bit more forceful in terms of getting a little bit angry or showing a little bit of disappointment or even just sort of being a little bit stronger, you know, it, it compels them in a way that just sort of saying, you know, let's not make a mess, let's not make a mess, let's not, you know, over and over it doesn't. And so I struggle with that because on the one hand, I don't want to, just be you know reacting from my amygdala to my kids. I want to be sort of being compassionate and so forth. But kids often do seem to respond more to a little bit more forceful responses. So I'm just curious how you think about kind of resolving that paradox. How to how to remain mindful but still you know how to be compelling to your kids. Yeah, I don't think there's any contradiction between mindfulness and being compelling. I think that you know that it is important for your children to understand that there are structures, and you know it's. It, you know, you can, you know, play, you know, you play a little bit, okay, let's put it all away, let's, you know, here we are, sing a song, put it away, and then they start punching each other, you know, it's like, okay, we're not playing anymore, we're putting things away. And you can have that kind of, you know, compelling quality in your voice, but you need to strip out the anger, and that's what the mindfulness practice helps with. But I don't think it's a problem being, you know, giving very clear, compelling statements to your children. I think it's important you, you, they need if, that. If you're firm, even in a detached way, that, that's, that works as well as... It works better. Angry. It works better. If, you, if, you, if you've got anger issues coming up, it probably doesn't have anything to do with the child doing what they're doing. So one of the great things about parenting is that it's a workshop to show you the places within yourself that you haven't addressed yet. And that's why you're saying, like, they kind of go for it. They do kind of go for it, you know. They, they, they're gonna, they want to push. They want to know, how big a container do I have here? You know, how much can I trust you to support me without getting off balance? And, you know, what happens when I push you, you know? I mean, those are, those are important questions for children to know the answer to. And what's really important 
to do is to give them a clear answer. You can push me this far, but you can't push me any further. And if you push me any further, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to reject you, but you are going to have some consequences. And we're going to apply those consequences in a consistent and clear way. And I think, I think that... And that's the structure you're talking about. That's the structure we're talking about, exactly. And you know, if you address your anger issues, then you've got a structure. If you don't address your anger issues, you don't have a structure. Or the kids are like, I don't know what to do. Like, you know, they and then they pull back, they hold back. They're not, you know, they they they're thinking about what am I gonna do and how is it gonna affect you rather than what am I gonna do and how is that gonna affect me? Right? You don't wanna be you don't want to have children in that position. They wanna know, they need to know what's going to happen at any given time in general. I mean, of course, you know, things can happen that are outside the box, but they, they generally need to have consistency. And I think it's a big mistake. A lot of times in spiritual communities, there's this idea that you're not allowed to be angry or that you shouldn't listen to your anger or you should overcome your anger. I actually think anger tells us important things. And I think that you know, you can't, you know, just be unleashing your anger all the time and say, oh, I have my right to my anger. But if you have, if you are getting angry, it may be because your boundary is being violated. Or your child may be getting angry because her boundaries are being violated. And that needs to be listened to. And you don't want to give her the same instruction that you give yourself. I have to overcome my anger. I can't be angry. You know, and, and she's, you know, she's got somebody who's, you know, taking her books at school all the time and she's angry good. She should be angry, right? It's, you know, it's not like, okay, well, let's think about forgiveness. No. Let's think about why are you angry? You're angry because you're being violated. How are you being violated? How do you deal with that violation? What is the most useful way in approaching working with that violation other than your anger? But listen to the anger, right? And so I could give that same advice to you, you know? Yeah. yeah. Very okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. And how useful would it be if, in addition to listening to their child's calling and interest and providing that environment for them to fulfill that potential, you also introduce um, like a more structured mindfulness practice, some sort of practice in which they are asked to see it and to breathe and to do something that clearly is not coming from them, but rather from us trying to teach them some tools and skills that are useful for us. Um, is that going against that principle of allowing them to be themselves? No, the idea of doing some kind of a structure like a mindfulness practice is exactly what I'm talking about. It's a structure that's coming out of a set of values that you hold dear, OK? So you're going to sit with your child and say, OK, this is something that's important to me. This is something that I value. And I'd like to offer it to you to see what you do with it, right? And there, you know, I don't, I don't think that that's inhibiting the child's expression in any way. It's, it's offering again structures that are based on your values through which the child can learn about themselves, and that's helpful. Right. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering about the idea of the, um, the deepest calling, and to what extent do you think it's something that's kind of set? at birth, and to what extent do you think it might be influenced by the experiences the child has, maybe before he or she is able to, to demonstrate uh, affinity for any particular sort of thing? Um, Sorry, the what? Maybe, like, um, to what extent do you think that that might be influenced by the experiences the child has before he or she is old enough to be able to show an affinity for certain types of things or people or experiences? Um, and I, I guess part of my question is, how young do you see this calling in children? I see it from almost the moment they're born. Okay. Yeah. And um, there are lots of experiences that children can have. You're asking, you know, are th you know, is this something that's in them, or is it something that comes forward as they mature and have external environmental influences on them? I you know, the question of nature versus nur 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 nurture, right? Um, I, you know, again, so here's my opinion, okay? So um, I, I actually firmly, totally, and completely believe, okay, there's an opinion, <laughs> um, that 
Everyone is, has something in them that calls them to life. And different people have different experiences that either help them fulfill that calling or they have experiences where their experience of life is a thwarting of that calling. But the calling is there either way. And it depends. I mean, one of the great tragedies that I see every day is how many people have so much beauty in them that they can't express, right, because of their wounding or their pain, right? And so you know, you want to be able, of course, we have all kinds of ways in depth hypnosis of resolving that pain, changing that pain, changing the relationship to that pain, releasing the potential, releasing the calling. I mean, that's what I do all day long. <laughs> so, so I feel like my opinion is somewhat informed here. It may be anecdotal, but you know, I can give you lots of data of people who feel better, you know, being able to release their their, their, their sense of calling into the world. Everyone feels better when they do that. Mm. There's some back there, yeah, right here, there. That's okay, go ahead, you were talking. Um, yeah, you mentioned about uh, resources that, I guess, at, at your organization, you teach about resources to use to call on during parenting, resources yes. to call on during parenting. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering if you could maybe mention any, some things about resources that, I guess you mean like at the exact time that some issues coming up there's some like I've heard that term before and I was just wondering what you what you're what I'm referring to with those resources is that we um, we spend some time doing some inner guided meditation to help connect with aspects of ourself that actually do know how to parent a lot you know that or, or have some wisdom that we don't normally tap into because we're, you know, trying to, you know, get the milk ready and like get the bus driver to wait and, you know, and um, the uh, I think that this is one of the values of meditation is to help you be, be able to look inward, but the the guided meditations that we do are quite focused in connecting with an aspect of yourself that might take the form of you know a light or a sound or a person or an animal or something may take some form that that is kind of a reified aspect of this wisdom within yourself so that you can call upon it like when you're ready to like tear your hair out because your kid won't get their shoes on and it's time to go to school and you're going to be late for that meeting with your boss right so um you know where you can just you know, develop a relationship with this part of yourself in a more reified way so that you can connect with that and work with that as you're deciding what you're going to do about putting the shoes on, right? It kind of slows everything down, right? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I particularly... Um, appreciate your focus on like really helping the kid discover themselves. Um, and I noticed that you, you talked also about st uh, some structures that help them uh, kind of learn emotional intelligence skills, be more whole, that sort of thing. Um, but I feel like as a parent, you are sort of bombarded with all these structures that people suggest or that you know society holds as like a standard. Um, and so you very quickly get into the situation where you know, you have to choose those structures and in so doing you kind of choose, um, you make decisions based on your values, assuming that they will be their values, right? The, the business school example, for, for instance. Um, you know, I feel like some parents would look at that decision as, well, you can't have a comfortable living if you're a musician, right? So make sure you have, so, this, so that's, and, and you don't know whether your kid is going to replicate that value or not, right? Um, and then there are other things that, you know, structures that seem kind of arbitrary, like uh, anything from table manners to, you know, learning how to spell correctly. Um, so the, you have to make lots of decisions for your, for your kid sort of before you know or they know what that, how they would choose. Um, and so I wonder how you sort of approach that. Well, as I mentioned, um, that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that I think is most helpful to focus on, especially when kids are little, is 
What do I need to do to keep them safe? And what do I need to do to keep them happy? Right? And those at that and that doesn't mean giving them all the candy they want, you know, and, and it doesn't mean, you know, putting them on a leash, you know. <laughs> right? It's it's, you know, how you know so when they're especially when they're little, those those big meta those are two things that you can always focus on if you're trying to make a decision. What do I think about this computer game? Okay. Is this gonna keep my kid feeling safe? Or is the violence in that game going to give them nightmares? OK, I guess I'm not going to give them that computer game, right? So um, but if you think about safety, safety and happiness, and then you just use that as a measure as you're holding it up against like all of the bombardment, as you say, of the cultural environment. You know, I have to say, as a parent, I felt like my main primary duty became filtering the culture. It was like it was so important because there's so much in the culture. I mean, I have a degree in cultural anthropology, so you know I'm already looking at culture, right? But but uh, there's so much in the culture that is deadening, and you have to decide. Uh, from my again, that's my opinion, right? But it's, and you have to decide to what extent do I want my child to be, in, you know, influenced by that. And the way you answer that is: Is this going to keep my ha child happy and safe? Right, I, f I find that that is a really, if you if you don't take anything else away from this talk, just think mantra. What will keep my child happy and safe? You know, and you may have different ideas than other people, but you know you're doing your best. I mean, I don't again, I don't think there's one answer because I, I think there are general answers. You know, but every child has has their own tolerances, and every parent has their own set of values. So you have to, again, you have to have enough structure to allow for a range of expression, not so much structure that you crush it. And those two questions, what will keep my child safe and what will keep my child happy, navigate those two poles pretty well. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Issa will be around even after if you want to talk to her and go into a rant with her and to give opportunity for the live stream for questions. So one person emailed Kendall. Uh, Luchika, emailed I'm sorry, I don't think that's on. So in case, is it? Okay. Yeah. But oh, okay. okay, I'll come closer to you, Lisa, okay. so you can hear me. Um, so Kendall would love to know her. Uh, what's your opinion on CDC announcing that they're coming to Palo Alto plus Silicon Valley to study our mass teen suicides that you may have heard of um, occurring in Palo Alto in particular? And why do you think that might be? Um, she thinks that she she has her own hypothesis of like because she lives here, but is interested in knowing what's causing um, what could be causing the teen suicides. Um, the question is uh, from the live stream: What do I think might be causing the surge in teen suicides in Palo Alto? Well, the first thing I always say is that every case is completely individual. You know, it's very difficult to make generalizations about any form of behavior. Um, I would say that, you know, this is a very difficult time to be alive. I would say that, you know, our children at a very young age are dealing with the specter of environmental destruction. There's a great sorrow in that. I also think, and that's, it's very hard to be young and realizing that, that this is what's happening, right? It's hard enough for us as we're older to confront it. But I think that also there is a lot of violence in this culture. I, you know, I know that's my opinion, but there is a lot of violence in this culture. And when you have a lot of violence that is tolerated, like on TV shows and cartoons and video games, when you have a lot of violence that is witnessed and seen in all the different media places where children are seeing it, it's not too far a step to think about that violence being turned inward. It's like there's a tolerance of, of violence in the culture generally that I personally think is not healthy. 
So the the idea of self destruction is not too far away from you know the kind of destruction that they're seeing all around them all the time. Now I think that every one of those children, like I would really like to sit down with every one of those children, or you know I would have loved the opportunity to sit down because there is this phenomenon that is occurring, and this is something that Jimpa spoke to, and it's something that I speak to all the time, which is this split within the self that arises in the West, which is a form of self-loathing. And it's a disease that we have here in the West that doesn't seem to exist so much in other places, although everyone else is catching it. <laughs> but um, this inner division of um, the rejection of the self. And Jimpa tells a story about this. Well, I actually, <laughs> before I got to know Jimpa as well as I do, um, I used to tell this story because I heard this interview that he gave on Fresh Air in you know the 90s. And when Terry Gross asked him, um, what is the most difficult thing you've ever had to translate for His Holiness? And he said that he was in an East-West conference and he translated the word self-loathing into Tibetan. And His Holiness stopped him and said, no, 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 you must be doing that wrong. That must, that's the wrong. That's the wrong translation. And Jimpa said, no, that's, that's the translation. It's self-loathing. And His Holiness said, but the self cannot loathe the self. So, I mean, one of the most erudite people on the planet did not understand that we do have this disease here in the West of the self-loathing the self. And this is one of the primary things that I work with. Um, I'm, I have a new book coming out called Coming to Peace. And it's about the reflection of inner violence in outer relationships and the way that our outer relationships express or give us information about our own inner violence. Other, other inner experience as well, but um, it's a book about conflict resolution, basically saying that we cannot have peace in external relationships until we have peace in the, the internal relationship with ourselves. And I think that there is this idea, you know, this scientific idea that, you know, you know, what is this self, you know, you know, this is not scientific, we can't prove it, you know, what is this? And there's this rejection of spirit, this rejection of the soul, this rejection of this deeper part of the self, which is extremely unscientific, uh, to uh, just reject this aspect of experience. And so people don't have tools, they don't have vocabulary to speak to this kind of inner dislocation that they experience because it's, there's nothing, you know, rational or, you know, replicable about it. And yet, people suffer deeply internally because they cannot rest in themselves. And one of the reasons they cannot rest in themselves is because they look around them, there's so much violence, there's no place to rest externally. They go inside themselves. They haven't been able to develop resources because everyone says there's no such thing as spirit, there's no such thing as soul, there's no such thing as the deeper self. And so they're left with this emptiness, right? So there's my attempt to answer that question. And I would imagine that most of those teens were walking somewhere along in this field of experience that I've just described here. Thank you, Isa, for coming down today and answering our questions and sharing your wisdom. Um, Isa will be here for uh, lunch, so if you want to join us or ask her, uh, questions if some of them were not answered, please come up and, uh, and join the Mindful Dash Parenting Group. Right now I'm announcing it to GPAWS at an SIY Alumni and Parents Network, but I'm sure like not everybody is a parent or interested in it, so we'll start communicating to Mindful Dash Parenting Group more about these conversations and talks. So. Um, and if you want, if you have passion for this field, you know, just write to me and we can organize events and classes here together as well. So thank you for coming and thanks to everyone who joined our live stream as well. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks.